Radio Retropolis. I'm Jim Romanovich, and welcome to the Dragnet Radio Podcast here on Radio Retropolis. Tonight, a dead body was found in the streets in the early hours of the morning, and there's only one clue, a set of skid marks on the pavement. This is called The Big Frame from July 6th, 1950, here on Radio Retropolis. <laughs> The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a hit-and-run felony detail. A dead body is found in the streets in the early hours of the morning. There's only one clue, a set of skid marks on the pavement. Your job, find the killer. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end... From crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, April 19th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of traffic division. My partner is Ben Romero. The boss is Lieutenant Calfee, Commander AID. My name's Friday. It was 7.55 a.m. when I got to the second floor at 123 South Figueroa Street. Accident investigation. Get and run felony detail. Morning, Joe. George? Yeah. How is it? Oh, it's not much better. Still aching. Oh, rough. A lousy thing kept me up most of the night. Check with that dentist I told you about? Yeah, I did. It says it's a wisdom tooth. Yeah? This one here. Oh, yeah. It says it's got to come out. I'm supposed to go back and see him today. That's rough. Remember, a friend of mine had his wisdom teeth out. Hurt like the devil. Terrible. Finally pulled him. Ached for five, six days after. Mm-hmm. Roger. Excuse me, Joe. Yeah, McKee. Better have a 57 on that follow-up you handed yesterday, huh? Okay. I got most of it down. I'll finish it up. Friday? Hi. Ben, come in yet? He's down the record bureau. Let's we'll see that jaw of yours. Hmm. Yeah. Hasn't gone down much. Uh, it's a bad wisdom tooth. Dennis says he's going to have to yank it. Bum deal, man. Eh? That's the first time I ever had any trouble with him. I remember a few years back, my sister Gertrude had trouble with a wisdom tooth. I'm packed in. Yeah. Whole side of her face was swollen. Poor kid was in terrible pain, full week. Even after they pulled it, it still hurt. Uh-huh. Hi, Joe. Uh-huh. Picked up the overnight reports down at Records, Mac. Here you are. Oh, thanks, Ben. This one on top here. I'd like to have you two check it out. Uh, dead body report. Yeah. You left me a note on it. That's about all. Hard to figure. What's the story? Just what you see in the report. The victims. Edward Raymond Stokes, 732 Delano Street, apartment 2. His body was found in the gutter near 63rd in Vermont, 3 o'clock this morning. No witnesses. Only one piece of evidence. Yeah, see, they got it listed here. Skid marks near the body. Is that all? That's it. Parent hit and run. Where's the body, man? Neighborhood mortuary out there. Emerald Hills Funeral Home. One of the deputy coroners handled the body. A fellow named Joe Larimore. Anybody claim it yet? No. Okay. Ben, you ready? Yeah, let's go. We'll check you later, man. Yeah, if you need any help, I've got McClendon and Rogers on hand. Right. How do we manage to draw all the choice ones? I don't know. Skid marks and a dead body. Yeah. Oh, say, I almost forgot. How's your jaw? Oh, it still hurts. Oh, it's tough. Yeah, it's still swollen. Mm-hmm. What did Dennis say? Wisdom tooth. Oh, miserable. Yeah. Wife had the same thing a couple of years back. Dennis tried to yank the tooth and it broke right in two. Finally got it out. That's good. Funny thing about wisdom, T. What's that? After they pull him. Hurts for five, six days. Eight thirty three AM. Ben and I drove out to sixty third in Vermont and rechecked the spot where the dead body of Edward Stokes had been found. According to the report, the body was found two feet west of the easterly curb and 32 north of 63rd Street on Vermont. 
We examined the skid marks. They showed definite signs of being a lot older than 24 hours. The consistency of the rubber was weak, and there were heavy dirt smudges over them, indicating more wear than they could have possibly had since the estimated time of the victim's death. We got back in the car and drove to the Emerald Hills Funeral Home at Vernon and Denver Avenue. Sure is rotten weather for April, huh? Yeah. These funeral homes, you ever notice it? What's that? Why do they always put awnings over the windows? They never open drapes. I don't know. Come on. Funeral going on. You know where the office is? There's a brass plate on that door over there. Let's have a look. Yes, sir? Here's somebody, Jim. Oh. Gentlemen, may I be of service? Police officers. I'd like to talk to Mr. Larimore. I believe he's a deputy coroner. Hi, Mr. Larimore. You came about the hit-and-run victim? Yeah, that's right. This is Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday. We'd like to check the body if we could. Certainly. It's back this way. I understand you moved the body from the scene of the accident here to the mortuary. Yes, that's right. Early this morning. Unusual case. Careful, there's two steps down just inside the door. Thank you. Why do you say it's unusual, Mr. Larimore? Well... Here, let me show you. There. Now, for one thing, the victim had a basal skull fracture. I don't know about you gentlemen, but in the hit-and-run cases I've handled, a basal fracture is a pretty rare thing. Well, it is possible, isn't it? Mm, yes, it's possible. Anything's possible, as they say. But it's not usual. And a few other things here, too. Yeah. Notice the victim's knee here. Single, clean cut. Also, these wounds on the head... I've never seen anything like it in hit-and-run cases I've been called in. Yeah, that wound on the knee doesn't jive, does it? If he was hit by a car, the knee should be skinned up quite a bit. Exactly. Well, you know how it usually is. The automobile hits the victim. There's always signs that the body was either dragged or thrown. Shredding of clothing, skin knees, legs, elbows. No sign of that here. You don't think the victim could have been killed by hit-and-run cars, eh? No, I don't say that. It's possible that it might have been a car, but... Well, let's say it's not very probable. Has anybody at all inquired about the body, Mr. Larimore? No one, no. That's funny. Oh, uh, Mr. Larimore, may I see you in a minute, please? All right, Tom. Excuse me a moment? Yeah, sure. Well? Yeah. Where do we start? I don't know. Maybe we won't have to. Hmm? Another lead like this, and we can turn it over to homicide. Sergeant? Yeah? There's a young lady in the lobby. Yeah. She wants to claim the body. The girl was shown the body. She identified it as that of Edward Raymond Stokes. She gave her name as Marion Fuller, the victim's common-law wife. After she recovered from her shock, she asked if she might sit down for a while and rest. We took her into one of the offices in the mortuary, and Ben got her a glass of water. She told us that she had last seen Stokes alive at about 1 a.m. that morning. They'd been drinking together at a neighborhood bar on Vermont Avenue between 63rd and 64th Streets half a block from where the victim's body had been found sprawled in the gutter. Why don't you sit down over there, Miss Fuller? Mm, thanks. How long did you know Edward Stokes, Miss Fuller? About six years. On and off. We've been together pretty much the last couple of years, though. No, oh, my head. Do you mind telling us exactly what happened while you were with Stokes last night? Everything mm. you can remember? I can't think. This headache's killing me. I wish you'd try, Miss Fuller. It's important. Well... Nettie and I had dinner together at the Spanish oven, place down on South Fig. That was about a quarter to eight. Then we drove out to the Brown Barrel in Vermont, the bar I told you about. Yeah. Nettie and I go there most of the time. We stayed there and drank, played a little shuffleboard. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, we stayed too long, drank a little too much. I started talking to this fellow next to me, and he got sore. Always got jealous when he was drunk. Poor Eddie. Did Eddie fight with this other man, Miss Ford? No, no, I stopped him. That made Eddie mad. He never could drink right. He always wanted to pick a fight. Who was the other man, you remember? No, I don't. I guess I had a lot to drink, too. He's just some guy at the bar. This headache. Well, it's not going to take much longer. Just a few more questions. That organ's getting on my nerves. What happened after you broke up the argument between Stokes and the other man? Oh, nothing. We... Stayed in the bar. Eddie played shuffleboard most of the time. I was in one of the booths drinking. Yeah. Around one o'clock, I started feeling sick, so I went outside and sat in the car. I guess I passed out there. In your car? No. 
I guess it belonged to one of the fellows in the bar. I passed out, and that's all I can remember. Did you sleep in the car all night? No. I guess whoever owned it drove me home. Well, how did they know where you lived? Must have been one of her friends. I don't know. I don't remember anything until this morning. They phoned me up and said Eddie was dead. Who phoned you, Miss Fuller? One of our friends. I don't remember. I had a rotten headache. Well, you can do better than that. I tell you, I don't remember. He phoned and told me Eddie was dead. Somebody ran Eddie down. All right. Where are we going? Downtown. We'll have a stenographer take your statement. Oh, I've got a terrible hangover. I've never had one as bad as this. Neither has Eddie. Let's go. On the way back to the office, Ben stopped at a drugstore and I picked up a box of aspirin. The wisdom tooth was giving me trouble again. The clerk at the soda fountain fixed something for Marion Fuller's hangover. When we got her back to the office, we questioned her for more than an hour, but she gave us only one additional piece of information. The victim, Eddie Stokes, had been married before and divorced. His ex-wife lived out in the valley with their two children, and on several occasions she came to see Stokes at the Vermont Avenue bar when he failed to make the monthly payments for the support of the children. Each time they'd argued bitterly. We had a police stenographer take the floor woman's statement, and then she was released. 10.45 a.m., Sergeants Rogers and McClendon were assigned to check out the Vermont Avenue bar where Stokes had last been seen alive. Ben and I drove out to the valley to the home of Catherine Stokes, the victim's former wife. She met us on the front porch. Inside, it sounded like one of the children was practicing the piano. We told her what had happened. Last week, I think it was. Yes, Thursday last week. Eddie hadn't sent any money for the kids' support for three months. I hated to chase after him like that. There wasn't anything else I could do. Where did you meet him, Miss Stokes? That bar used to hang around. It's over on Vermont called the Brown Bell or something. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, wouldn't you like to come inside? Yes, thank you. Do you happen to know anybody by the name of Marion Fuller? Yes, Eddie mentioned her. It was a man seeing a woman like that. Do you know anything about her at all? No. Whenever I saw Eddie, he'd mention he was running along with her. I guess he wanted to make me jealous. Was your husband a pretty heavy drinker? Yes, he was. So I got the divorce. Eddie was such a fine boy when we got married. Good home. You didn't know any of the people he'd been running around with lately? No, just the fuller woman, that's all. Can you think of anything at all that might possibly have a bearing on his death? No. Eddie was probably drinking. Wandered in the street and a car hit him. I don't know. Oh, there's the bakery man. I've got to get some bread and a few things. Excuse me? I think that's about all, don't you, Joe? Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll leave our card here, Miss Stokes, in case you want to contact us for any reason. All right. It was so wonderful when we were married, Eddie and I. My folks gave us this house as a wedding present. We got wonderful presents. Yeah. We had everything we wanted. A car, nice house, kids. It was wonderful that we started drinking. Then everything went. Job, everything. Started all of a sudden. I never knew why. Yes, ma'am. How do men get that way? How do they start? I don't know. We only see a part of it. Yeah? When they finish. Twelve noon, Ben and I drove back into town to Vermont and 63rd Street for a meet with Sergeants Rogers and McClendon. They told us that they checked out the bartender who'd been on duty the night before and also seven of his customers. Their stories were almost identical. Each of them remembered seeing Eddie Stokes at the bar. Each of them remembered he was playing shuffleboard, that he was drinking heavily, and that he left the bar at about 1.45 a.m. All of us had the idea that for some reason the bartender and the customers were lying. In most cases, it's hard to find two witnesses who tell identical stories, let alone seven. For the rest of that afternoon, Rogers, McClendon, Ben, and I spent our time canvassing the neighborhood in the vicinity of the Brown Barrel Tavern. 4.45 p.m., We talked to the proprietor of a small grocery store two blocks down the street from the tavern. He told us that he rarely visited the bar, but that he thought that the man who ran the butcher shop next to his place, uh, Mr. Eugene Murray, was a regular patron of the Brown Barrel. So we went next door. Would you make that two pounds of ground ground, Mr. Murray? We're having company tonight. Yes, ma'am. Two pounds. Nice-looking meats, aren't you? Yeah, those steaks look good, don't they? Mm Mm-hmm. Two pounds. All 
Anything else now, Mrs. Gidney? Got some nice fresh kidneys today. No, no, George won't touch kidneys. That'll be all. You put it on the bill, won't you, Mr. Murray? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. Yes, sir, gentlemen. Can I help you? Police officers, Mr. Murray, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, sure. Glad to help out if I can. Have you ever been in the Brown Barrel Tavern down the next block there? Brown Barrel? I go there all the time. Say, would you mind if I fix up an order while we're talking? The customer's going to pick it up in a couple of minutes. I don't like to keep waiting. Sure, go ahead. i, I got to go to the ice box. When's the last time you were in the Brown Barrel, Mr. Murray? Last night. Wife and I went to the movies. One of them English pictures. Lousy pictures. We dropped in at the barrel and went home for a beer. About what time was that? Pretty close to two... <laughs> What's the matter? Some kind of trouble? Did you notice anything unusual while you were in there? Anybody fighting or arguing? No, we were only in there a couple of minutes, but now that you mention it, there was something funny happened. What was that? Well, the bartender Carl and a half dozen of the neighborhood gang were back in one of the booths talking together. They seemed kind of nervous, and none of them seemed to be having a good time. Yeah. The wife and I yelled hello at them, but they kind of gave us a go-by. Then this uh, drunk came up to us. Uh, any, uh, say, officer, would you reach that knife for me? Which one? Uh, that, that one. Oh, yeah, here you are. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, this uh, drunk came up to us and whispers to me, say, you better get out of here. There's been a fight. Hey, isn't that a beautiful piece of meat? Well, I didn't pay much attention to him. He was pretty drunk, could hardly understand him. I, I guess they have a lot of fights in there anyway. Is that all he told you, there'd been a fight? Yeah, that time. But he came back a couple of minutes later and whispered the same thing. You better get out. There's been a fight, he said. The wife and I just laughed at him. Mm -hmm. He said, I know all about it. A guy's been murdered. You are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. Six p.m. Ben and I went back to Homicide to turn the case over to them. They asked us to handle the investigation for another day because they were short of men at the moment and because there was still a big doubt as to whether or not Eddie Stokes had really been murdered. Actually, the only solid lead we had was the second-hand testimony of a drunken witness, that and the deputy coroner's doubts that Stokes was actually the victim of a hit-and-run. Mr. Murray, the butcher, didn't know the name of the man who told him that there'd been a murder and he could give us only a meager description. We brought Marion Fuller back in and re-questioned her. She stuck to her story. She didn't remember anything. She was released again. It looked like we were in for a long night. We went across the street for a bowl of soup and a sandwich, and when we got back, Ben called his wife and told her he'd be working late. I called my mother. Working late again? Oh, Joseph. How's your tooth feeling? Well, it's a little better, Ma. It's still pretty tender. I'm going to go to the dentist tomorrow. Yes, you've got to have that attended to right away. Bad teeth can poison your whole system. You be sure and see that dentist. Is he a good one? Yeah, he's okay. One of the fellas down here told me about him. I'll see you a little later. Huh? Don't wait up. Yeah, and you don't work too late, Joseph. You need your rest. Yeah, okay, Ma. Goodbye. All right, Joseph. Goodbye. Joe. Yeah? Just talk to that butcher's wife on the phone, Miss Murray. What'd she have to say? Ask her the same questions we asked Murray. She couldn't add much. Same story. You got something for me? Yeah, man. Rogers and McClendon just called in. They're still out at that bar. Yeah. Finally got somebody to talk a little. What'd they get? The bar boy out there. He says there was a fight happened about 1.30. Doesn't remember who was fighting. Not much, yeah? Bar boy's name is Milner. He told Rogers he went outside about 20 minutes to 2 to put the garbage out. He saw the Fuller woman asleep in that car. You get the license number? No. Said there was a ticket on the windshield. Ben and I checked with the sergeant of the watch at 77th Street Division. He told us Unit 111 was assigned to the area where the brown barrel was located. In checking their worksheet, we found that Unit 111 had issued a hang-on citation the night before to a car parked near 6330 and one-half Vermont Avenue, the address of the Brown Barrel Tavern. We checked the license number through DMV and found that the car was registered to a William R. Huddy, 14 Naylor Street. We drove out to the Naylor Street address and talked to Huddy's wife. She told us he was playing in a shuffleboard tournament that night at a bar down on South Olive Street. 8.55 p.m., we checked in at the bar. Bartender. Oh, yes, sir. What'll it be? Do you know if there's a William Huddy in here? He's supposed to be playing a shuffleboard game here tonight. Oh, no. 
Oh, yeah, I know. Good. He's with the Highland Park team. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, that's him up now. Out on the blue shirt. Thank you. Come on, Ben. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it, Bill. Good wait. Make it another three. That cleans him. Good one, Bill. Yeah, that's pretty close. Beat that one, Max. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah? Are you William Huddy? Yeah, that's right. Police officers. We'd like to talk to you a minute. Oh? What about? I'd like to ask you a few questions. You step over here a minute. Uh-oh. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Were you at the Brown Barrel Tavern out in Vermont last night? Yeah, I was. Why, what's the matter? You know uh, Marion Fuller? Yeah, yeah, she hangs around the place. She goes with a guy named Eddie. Did you drive her home last night? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. She passed out in my car. She's a nice kid, but she drinks a lot. I drove her home. Do you mind telling us what happened at the bar last night when you were there? Well, I come in about 9 o'clock and I start playing shuffleboard with a couple of guys. This guy, Eddie Stokes, is one of them. Yeah? We well, got in a beef with a guy at the bar over Marion. It's nothing big, though. The guy left after a while. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. That's about all. I left the place around 1.30, and they said he was beefing with some merchant seamen about that time. Was the Fuller girl still at the bar at that time? No, when I went outside, I saw her sleeping in my car, so I drove her home. I left her off and then come back to the bar. That's when they told me. Told you what? Well, they said Eddie had a fight with this merchant seaman. They said it'd be better if we kept it quiet. Who told you that? Call a bartender. And I got the real story from one of the fellows I was playing shuffleboard with, Leo McCarty. What did he tell you? Well, he said that when Eddie Stokes left, the merchant seaman followed him out. He said he chased Eddie. McCarty went out about five minutes later. Yeah. Well, the merchant seaman was gone as Stokes was lying in the gutter down the street. Mm-hmm. Did McCarty look at him? Yeah, he said Stokes looked pretty bad. He said he looked like he was dead, but I, I wouldn't believe that. Why not? This McCarty always exaggerates. 10.15 p.m., we had William Huddy come back to the office with us where we questioned him further and took his statement. Then we had his friend Leo McCarty brought in along with a bartender at the Brown Barrel Tavern and the customers that he'd framed his story with. McCarty was the first to give us the straight story and then the others followed. The bartender, Carl Jansen, who also owned the bar, was the last to break. How about it, Jansen? Why didn't we get a straight story to begin with? Well, what about the publicity? How, how would that look, murder around my place. Could work out worse than that, Mr. Jansen. You've been withholding evidence. You talked these people into the same deal. I'd protect myself. The newspapers, all the scandal. Recommends business. I had to keep it quiet. It's not my fault that Stokes is killed. I, I didn't do it. I'm not to blame. No, but you know who is to blame. Now, how about it? Who is he? Well, he works on the ships. Comes in here most of the time when he's in port. What's his name? Henry Baxter. I've cashed some of his paychecks. Ben, you better get the captain now. Yeah, okay. Hit and run felony Friday. Oh, yeah. No, just a minute. For you, Jansen. Oh, oh. yeah. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Yes, Rita, just a minute. Sergeant. Yeah. It's my wife. She's at the bar now. She thought you ought to know. Yeah. Henry Baxter. Frida says he just came in. I talked to Jansen's wife and told her to delay Baxter as long as possible without arousing his suspicions. 11.25 p.m. Ben and I and Mr. Jansen, along with Rogers and McClendon, drove out to the Brown Barrel Tavern on Vermont. When we got there, Baxter was gone. Mrs. Jansen told us he was pretty drunk by the time he left the bar. She'd watched him go down one block, cross the street, and then enter a small nightclub on the opposite side called the Pink Shamrock. She'd been keeping an eye on the place, and as far as she knew, Baxter was still inside. We went down the street to the nightclub. Rogers and McClendon covered the back entrance. We got inside in the middle of a floor show. A blonde was doing some kind of a dance. Can you spot him, Mr. Jansen? Mm. No. No, I don't see him yet. How about over on this side, back in the corner there? Mm. Yeah. No. No, he's not there. It's so dark in here, I can't see too well. There's the rear exit to the place. He could have slipped out that way. Gentlemen, like that oh. picture taken? Souvenir photograph? No, no, thanks. Maybe we better check with the waiter, Ben. All right, Sergeant, just a minute. That man over there at that table. Where? Yeah, yeah, I'm almost positive. Where? Right, right there next to that pillar. He's just behind it, you see? Yeah. Yeah, that's him, that's him. All right, come on, Ben. You stay right here, Mr. Jansen. You bet. 
Waiter. Hey, waiter. Another Coke high. You a waiter? Another Coke high. Your name is Henry Baxter? Yeah, that's right. What? Police officers like to talk to you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Outside. I sign nothing. Can we see a show? Let's go outside. Come on, Baxter. Hey, wait a minute. What's the beef, anyway? You know what the beef is. Sure, I know what the beef is. Come on, Baxter. Lousy punk Eddie Stokes trying to give me a bad time. Now he knows what a bad time is. Right, Baxter, come on. Lousy punk Stokes. I showed him how it's done. Keep your voice down. I slugged him. Pounded his head on the curb. He was drunk. He never knew what happened. Come on, outside. Hey, everybody, I killed Eddie Stokes. I killed him. Get him out of here. Yeah, okay. How's that tooth feel, Joe? It seems okay. Better have the dentist yank it out first thing tomorrow. Well, I think I'll hold off a while. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. On July 30th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Henry John Baxter was tried and convicted in Superior Court of manslaughter. He received the sentence as prescribed by law and is now serving his term in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Sarah Berner stars in Sarah's Private Caper next on NBC. That was The Big Frame from July 6th, 1950, here on the Dragnet Radio Podcast on Radio Retropolis. I'm Jim Romanovich. When you hear these Dragnet episodes, you think that Jack Webb and company could do no wrong. And in the late 40s and 50s, that was true. When Webb brought Dragnet back to TV in 1967, it was a different time and a different reality. It was the power of the youth generation. There were riots, rebellions, and a lot of anti-government sentiment. Now, the first season that Webb did, and part of the second season, was very strong as he gave us some hard-hitting cop stories. By the third season and the fourth season, Webb made Friday, I think he broke a little bit of a cardinal rule, which he never did before, and that is he made Friday a little preachy. Uh, Again, that was something he never did, as Dragnet was always about the procedure and never about pushing a political value. It was about value, but not a political value. Webb's personalization of the plot lines further alienated the audience he was hoping to reach. He was also getting older, yet the kids he was still trying to reach were still kids. They were still teens, and he was becoming this old man, and that was not cool. He became the very thing teens rebelled against, and Webb seemed more strident than ever as Friday became more a symbol of the establishment. His life and I'm talking about Jack Webb's life, had remained somewhat stifled since the early 50s. It was really unchanged. He was growing older, but he wasn't growing. Himself, personally. His career, gangbusters. His personal life was another story. He was alone. He smoked three packs of cigarettes a day. And he often slept at his office because of the workaholic He was. Yet he still reached that conservative demo with his Dragnet, the 60s version of the Dragnet series, which was huge enough to keep the show going strong. 
By 1970, it did fall out of the top 25, yet NBC still kept it on its schedule for a fifth season. Webb, however, decided that Dragnet's purpose had finally come to an end, and rather than go out limping, he decided to end it because he wanted to make that choice. And he also had some very strong shows coming up, including Adam-12. And immediately following that was Emergency, which went on for several seasons, each of those shows. So, was this the end of Dragnet? No, as we know, not at all. Once the me generation of the liberal 70s had ended, we were smack in the era of Reaganomics. It was Star Wars. And America was number one. That was the mantra of American youth. So, in 1982, Webb felt that this new patriotic youth movement, this generation, was ready for a new version of Dragnet. Well, sadly, Jack Webb succumbed to a massive heart attack on December 23, 1982, and the series reboot was dropped. But that wasn't the end of Dragnet. Dan Aykroyd and Tom Hanks did bring a campy version to the big screen in 1987. Did pretty good business. Made about $67 million worldwide. The the reviews were critically mixed, with most feeling that the humor fell flat. I was one of them. I thought it wasn't really that funny. Dragnet came back twice more. Once in 89 as a syndicated series lasting two short seasons, and then again in May of 2003 by Dick Wolf that lasted for another two very short seasons. By short seasons, I mean abbreviated episodes. Basically, without Jack Webb, there's really no dragnet, is there? Well, this was Jack Webb, and this was Joe Friday in the big frame from July 6th, 1950, here on Radio Retropolis. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time. Radio.